Welcome to the special meeting of the Bakersfield City Council. Now speaking, the Honorable Mayor Karen K. Go. Good evening. It's my pleasure to call to order the 430 City Council meeting of May 6, 2020. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. Here. Vice Mayor Parlier. Here. Councilmember Rivera. Councilmember Gonzalez. Here. Councilmember Weir. Councilmember Smith. I'm here. Councilmember Freeman. And Councilmember Sullivan. Thank you. Here. As you're aware, on March 4th, our governor declared a state of emergency in California due to the threat of COVID. The governor also passed several executive orders, including the suspension of some of the components of the Brown Act related to public meetings like this one. So as such, Councilmember Smith and Rivera, I believe, is going to join us. Uh, on the phone and we'll have an abbreviated meeting only with essential items tonight and all council votes will be conducted by roll call. Due to the governor's executive order which waived the Brown Act provisions requiring physical presence of the public in light of the virus, public comments have been received by the city clerk by email and phone. Madam Clerk, do we have any public comments? We have provided a uh, blue memo transmitting the only correspondence we've received. No public speaker cards have been received. Thank you. Next item, please. Under workshops, we have item A, fiscal update and fiscal year 2020-21 budget outlook. Mr. Clegg, would you like to make any comments? Absolutely. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, as we take our steps into our fiscal uh, situation. I also wanted to share some of my initial thoughts. I've been here for two months now. It, with COVID, it feels like uh, some days, maybe a little bit longer than that. <laughs> um, but been very uh, excited to um, dig in deeply in the organization and understand uh, from my perspective where things are at. And this is relevant to the budget process because it's framing how I'm thinking about approaching a recommended budget for the city council. And so I want to walk through um, some slides uh, that will uh, help uh, frame, uh, again, how I'm thinking about this. And I apologize, I did not get the clicker. Oh, thank you. See, rookie stuff. So. For uh, the city of Bakersfield, some of this story is not going to be new to you, but again, it helps frame how I'm thinking about this budget process. Uh, Bakersfield is a community that's been in transition. Uh, it was a quiet, friendly valley suburb with uh, important agricultural roots that's become an urban metropolitan area. It's doubled in size um, in the last you know, 30 years. Uh, we're nearly 400,000 people. Uh, in some instances, the city resources did not grow with the population, but the demand for services did. And the challenges that Bakersfield is facing today are increasingly complex urban challenges. I think also the state and regional landscape have changed significantly over the last decade. And our residents today are looking for 21st century service delivery. Also uh, for <clears throat> this organization, there's been a little bit of a roller coaster ride. Uh, in the early 2000s, the economy was strong. The Great Recession hit hard uh, throughout you know, this entire nation. Um, and then there was some modest recovery. But then as other cities continued to recover, the oil downturn hit the city of Bakersfield really hard. And so the, the roller coaster went down. And then um, as years got a little bit better after the oil downturn, uh, the organization was holding the line, but with some fairly scarce resources. Uh, leading to you know the conversation around Measure N. A lot of excitement about what can we do with these new resources, and then COVID hits. So the roller coaster continues. Um, I think that this organization has withstood a lot of difficult challenges. COVID is not going to be the punch that knocks out this organization. Uh, this organization will continue to go round after round of providing great services to this community. But I think it is important to recognize that there's been a lot of 
ups and downs, and this organization has never really had an opportunity to kind of stop and take a breath and uh, really get uh, focused and uh, set you know, strong um, goals moving forward. I think the work of the city council in this last year to dig deeper into the city council goals was a great step. Uh, but again, an organization uh, from my you know, outside coming in perspective uh, that uh, has, uh, like I said, not really had an opportunity to, to catch its breath. And with COVID, um, it's, you know, uh, an additional challenge. So thinking about not just a community being in transition, this organization has been in significant transition. Uh, during those roller coaster years, a significant number of key retirements and some important institutional knowledge leaving the organization. I think Measure N, while it's again exciting to, to see the possibilities that come with Measure N, there's a lot of expectations and a lot of new work to be done with Measure N with um, a, an organization that is still you know, building its capacity to deliver on all those expectations on Measure N. And then you add into that mix, you know, the, the first new city manager in 27 years, it's a lot of change. Um, you know, if you, you look at it from a change management pr perspective, the amount of change that this organization has had to absorb over the last 10 years, and especially over the last two years, it's really significant. Uh, change does bring opportunity, but I think it does need to also be managed and paced and some recognition for the amount of transition this organization's gone through. So here are some of my thoughts about strengths in this organization. You've got an incredibly dedicated staff. Um, there's great stability historically. There's good leadership been in this organization. Um, I think the community supports this organization. Uh, there, there's been work to have a business-friendly environment. Um, and as well, while it might be a smaller organization compared to some, or some other urban areas, there's a real get it done attitude. We'll, we'll find a way. Uh, and I think that also as a strength that you have community stakeholders that are willing to partner up and, and do uh, good things uh, with this organization. And then finally, there is now these new resources that you know, can uh, help this organization move forward to its next chapter. Any challenge can be looked at as an opportunity. Um, I think that there are you know, some challenges that this organization has faced, but I've uh, coined them here as opportunities. Um, there are several manual processes in this organization that can see some different automation to uh, modernize. I think also there's some it opportunities to go after some efficiencies that can improve our processes and procedures within this organization. Um, the, the staff capacity has been an issue. Again, as an outsider coming in, um, I can tell you that this organization has been uh, leanly staffed for a long time. Um, and if you just look at the, the numbers, it's pretty objective uh, that, that uh, they've been asked to do a lot with uh, staffing levels that are not comparable to other cities. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily wrong. Uh, I just think it's important to acknowledge that. And I think there's opportunities to build that staff capacity, give staff the tools that they need, and also the support that they need, again, to take that uh, deep breath, uh, set some really focused goals, and move forward hard on those goals. I think also uh, around best practices, I think there's some opportunities to pursue best practices that you see from uh, uh, other examples of other communities of the things that they've done well. Uh, always adding, you know, the nuance that's needed for a, a community. And then I think there's been opportunities that have been missed to foster local, regional, and state partnerships that leave us some, some really good room to grow and to do good things. Um, and then I think, too, just, you know, the community expectations have grown. Our opportunity is to, you know, meet that challenge and, and build up our capacity to meet those community expectations. Uh, my assessment, just looking at um, budgets and funding, is that you know this clearly this organization has made investments in growing the community, in important infrastructure and amenities, also in our economy and, and business sectors. I think there's been some deferred investment in urban renewal and neighborhood renewal. If you um, compare to other or, uh, communities, also deferred investment in technology tools and best practices, and as uh, I mentioned earlier, to uh, deferred investment in human capital. And this is not a criticism in particular. I think there is very limited resources in this organization. You have to set priorities. But with 
uh, n new resources, you can think about, you know, where do we now put our investments? So my thinking about investments moving forward, of course we need to invest in this community. Uh, in particular, I would suggest quality of life, our downtown and neighborhoods, economic development coming out of COVID and economic recovery is gonna be really important. I think um, continuing to invest in a, a business friendly approach is gonna be really important. And I think also investing in uh, efficiencies in professional workforce, those are investments that have real returns. I think if we uh, go after uh, efficiencies, it can help us to actually do more with less as we have some, some modernization and, and some automation. I just wanted to reflect really quickly on human capital since the last point on the last slide that, you know, the, the greatest resource, particularly in a service industry, and I view a city organization as a service industry, our greatest resource is our human capital, and that's the people in the community and the people within the organization. And if we invest in that human capital, we're gonna get a lot more out of the dollars that we spend. So then, what about COVID-19? What's our reality? Of course, with Measure N or PSVS, we can't do as much as we had hoped to do in, in our next year. Revenues are going to be down. We'll walk through the numbers with you. We have to be conservative. I think it's a wisdom in us to um, build in contingencies and be conservative. And I think when we make investments, they need to be targeted towards your council uh, priorities. And uh, we need to make sure that there's you know, uh, work that's done to make sure that we're, we're saving where that we can. That being said, Bakersfield is uniquely positioned. Most cities uh, you know, operate their budgets uh, from a fully programmed perspective. What's available, they budget it. Um, and uh, fortunately for the city of Bakersfield, the PSVS funds have not been fully al allocated to ongoing costs. Um, that means you know, those positions that have been added in P PSVS, they don't have to go away. They don't have to be cut back because there's room in that PSVS budget. I think um, we will have some challenges on the general fund side, and we'll walk through those in a few minutes, uh, but we can address our anticipated revenue reductions. I think there'll still be some tough decisions for the city council, but not nearly the scale and scope that other cities are facing. Um, we do need to be um, conservative um, and, uh, and save, as I mentioned, but we can target funds towards some strategic priorities. And I would just recommend that, you know, it's, it's um, not popular to, to say we need to pace ourselves and there are limits to this organization, but I think my objective observation for, for you is that, um, that there are limits to what, you know, the staff capacity is. And so I approach the prioritization framework as those city council goals that you have set, the priorities established for Measure N and PSVS, and I would just add to that economic recovery coming out of COVID. I think we need to double down on the council goals. Uh, we need to um, think about investing in those particular areas and where we're gonna have the greatest return our, on our investment and uh, measure our work against those goals. And so uh, in conclusion, uh, I'm approaching this budget of course with a lot of fiscal prudence we're gonna build in some additional contingency uh, of uh, funds. Uh, we want to also invest though in some areas that can help the economy recover. Um, I do wanna highlight uh, the next point though that you know, we could make some more dramatic cuts that might um, um, look like being fiscally conservative, but I think if we cut too deep, it really gets at that capacity issue. And I think if we, if we cut too deep, it limits our ability to continue to deliver on the council goals where I genuinely think we, we can continue to deliver. And uh, the, the, these last points are about maintaining some of those long awaited investments in our organizational capacity and, and pursuing those goals. So uh, with that, I'm happy to, to entertain any questions or comments from the council, but we have another half of the presentation which is the actual numbers, I just wanted you to appreciate how I'm thinking about this organization and what I've observed over the last two months. Um, and if there aren't any questions, I'll turn it over to, to Chris Hewat to dig into the numbers. Colleagues, are there any questions before we go on to Mr. Hewat's presentation? Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just quickly, um, 
Mr. Clegg, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I just wanted to point out that uh, your, I'm sorry, uh, one, two, three, four, fifth slide, referring uh, deferred investment in urban renewal and neighborhood renewal. I really appreciate this. Uh, it, it speaks to one of the council's goals uh, that we have established this last year with regard to really um, uh, focusing on reinvestment in the in the urban core. Um, and so I just want to commend you for, for pointing that out. And then the other note is that we learned uh, this past week that uh, Bakersfield continues to grow. And so I think that also needs to be on our um, minds as we look at uh, you know, uh, the next fiscal year and where to invest. We know that demands for city services continue to grow uh, over time um, and, and we need to meet those demands as best we can. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. Colleagues on the phone, is there anybody who would like to make a comment to Mr. Clegg before we go on to the next part of the presentation? Julie, can you confirm just in case? I have none. None. Okay, uh, I don't see any other requests to speak, so welcome, Mr. Hewat. Good evening, good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, City Council Members, Chris Hewat, City Manager's Office. It's nice to be before you once again uh, in the room. It's been a while. Uh, I wish I was here under uh, a little bit different circumstances, but nonetheless, we wanted to provide you a very brief update. Uh, normally, I would be here in the first meeting of May kicking off our proposed budget and really giving you uh, uh, an overview of the spending plan for next fiscal year. Uh, unfortunately, due to the rapid nature of the changing circumstances over the last few weeks, we're not able to do that. What we are able to do is provide you with the framework of where we believe we are headed in terms of revenues and some major pinch points uh, that we see uh, moving forward. Uh, but as Mr. Clegg mentioned, uh, we believe that we are uh, a little bit better positioned maybe than other municipalities throughout the state. Uh, so I, I take that in, in terms of the optimism uh, as we move forward. We have some compounding issues locally. We do have the COVID-19 issue that you all are well aware of. Uh, we have unprecedented action uh, taken across all levels of government uh, to reduce or eliminate all non-essential activities. It goes without saying there have been significant impacts uh, throughout the community in terms of layoff, income reductions, uh, reduced business profit. Those all, uh, all those uh, types of impacts impact the city's bottom line you know, with our major revenue uh, sources. Compounding that is oil and oil prices. And it's no secret that since early March, we've seen a downturn in prices. Uh, that was primarily due at the time uh, due to shifts in, in the global market. Uh, since then, it's taken on uh, uh, you know, issues in, in the COVID area as well. Local oil prices went from about $55 a barrel, they were pretty steady for, for several years, uh, to under $20 a barrel. Uh, that was the lowest price that we've seen locally since around 2002. They've rebounded slightly, but that just to, just to give you some perspective. Uh, pr the production activity, the, the, the activity that occurs out uh, in the unincorporated parts of the county uh, trickles down to the city, so in production, uh, and prices go down and, and production eases up. We see um, layoffs, we see equipment purchases going down, we see disposable income going down, and that all trickles down to city revenues. I wanted to just give you an idea of what other cities are facing across the state. I have uh, four headlines that I pulled this week, again, just to give you some perspective. Uh, in City Ma Monica, they're looking at uh, potentially laying off 337 permanent employees. They have a significant budget gap uh, of almost $90 million in the current fiscal year, and that, I think, is over $150 million next fiscal year. The City of Monterey uh, is looking to lay off workers similar to actions taken in San Jose. San er, Sacramento has a $90 million shortfall. Uh, but they are not looking at cuts or layoffs. This is just a, a handful of what we're seeing both uh, regionally uh, up and down the state and then across the nation. We don't really have any historical data that precisely fits the circumstances that I just outlined. Uh, Randy uh, McKeegan, our finance director, myself, others have been uh, looking over many sets of data, talking with many people across uh, the industry 
to get a better sense of what other cities are doing and then also locally uh, what our impacts will be. We went back, obviously, and looked at our recession years. We've had experiences uh, looking at what the energy downturn does to the city, uh, and so we, we culled that data pretty carefully. We've had many, many meetings with sales tax consultants, uh, with other uh, industry groups that help us uh, better understand what the potential impacts are, but I can tell you that uh, as good a data as they have been historically been able to provide to us, this is a, a new, um, new realm. Again, looking at all data, uh, and what I'm showing you uh, is a lot of the data is predicated on some minor recovery uh, that we're expecting starting in first quarter of 2021. Again, that's kind of the, the mantra that we're, we're getting. So I'm going to talk uh, just about a few things this evening. Uh, fiscal year 1920, the year that we're in currently and what we're seeing there, uh, and then looking to next year and what we can uh, plan for, at least at this point, moving forward want to start off with the current fiscal year, and there's a lot of numbers up here. I'm going to walk you through those. Uh, so on the left side is the major revenue sources that are being impacted uh, by uh, COVID oil right now. Uh, as you know, the hospitality industry and hotel stays are down, and that impacts our, our transient occupancy tax. Uh, what I'll show you are three numbers in the percentage. Uh, the first two numbers, the first number, 9.9, .9, is the Revenue projections as the council adopted them uh, in July or in June of, of last year. We do a mid-year budget update and, and, and at that mid-year budget update that we did back in February, things were looking like you know pretty, pretty steady growth of revenues and so we didn't make any changes to our, our revenue projection for TOT at that point in time. We still had $9.9 million, $9 million. We are on target to meet that projection. Of course, with everything going on uh, now, we are seeing some significant reductions in hotel occupancy corresponding impacts to TOT. Uh, we're now showing that we will likely end the year with about $7.7 .7 million in revenue, or a, about a 22% decrease uh, between now and, and the end of the year you know, annualized. As you know, uh, we now have uh, two, I'll call it buckets of sales tax. Bradley Burns is part of the, the state seven and a quarter percent rate that the city gets. We get about 1% of that. Uh, and you'll see again, we started the year at 75.3. We looked like we were gonna do a little bit better, you know, in February when we started to look at, at uh, the end of the year. But now uh, we're, we're seeing uh, obviously the signs of, of some significant decreases to the tune of almost uh, 5% for the last two quarters. Again, PSVS, similar. We had some very robust quarters, uh, so that's why you saw we went from $61.8 million to a, an initial revised year-end estimate of 742 uh, because again, those first two quarters that we saw from PSVS uh, were well above any uh, our estimates at the time. We're ratcheting that back down again. Property tax uh, trails these types of circumstances by 18 months or so, uh, so we're not really anticipating significant changes there. Uh, there has been some um, action by the county to work with individuals who may be late or, or need a few more days to pay their, their property taxes in the current year. Um, but in talking with uh, the property tax collector's office uh, in, in detail, they don't expect a significant amount of delinquent payments. And then of course, uh, we are seeing some decreases in develop on the development side uh, with uh, single family homes. We're seeing a lot of uh, home improvement type of work right now, uh, but that's not, uh, that, that doesn't, uh, generate significant permitting revenue. So I'll just go into specifics about each of these revenue sources real quick. I wanted to give you an idea of where we are with our TOT and those occupancy rates I mentioned. You can see here uh, the, the blue line, the, the teal line, uh, that is the current year occupancy rate by week. And you can see as we started to move into mid-March uh, when the stay-at-home order was put in place, uh, that occupancy rate took a nosedive. The yellow line is that same week for last year. So we're averaging anywhere between 65 and 70 percent hotel occupancy in a normal year. That dipped down to about 30 percent. It's crept up the last couple weeks, 
uh, which I will take as a positive right now. Uh, but again, you can get an idea of how that is trending. Comparatively, statewide, uh, the occupancy rate for hotels is around 28%. So that gives you some perspective on where we are locally. <clears throat> I don't want this to be too confusing, but we are, for the remaining, uh, remaining months, uh, we're expecting about a 75% decrease in, in TOT in the, in the current fiscal year. What that means, uh, a lot of cities will utilize hotel taxes for ongoing general fund expenditures. The city of Bakersfield has historically not done that. The city of Bakersfield has normally uh, used the majority of hotel taxes for um, capital projects for general fund funded type of operations. So think fire station, rehabs, playground, upgrades, uh, any capital projects that the police department may need, streets funding. So what that means is we're likely going to have to come back to you in a couple of weeks and request and recommend that we reduce current year capital project spending by about $2.1 million. That's going to require the deferral of several capital projects. If you recall, when we went through the energy downturn a couple years ago, we took a similar action. It was prudent at the time to right-size our revenues with uh, what was projected. Again, we're going to bring that back to you with a list of detailed projects uh, in, in a few weeks. Bradley Burns, which is, again, that, that portion of the state-based sales tax rate that the city gets, uh, is going to show significant declines starting in the second quarter of, of this year. Uh, we're one quarter delayed in getting those receipts and getting that information from the state. Uh, so the next report we get will be for the first quarter of 2020, which likely won't show a lot of decline. But that's a kind of a false sense of security. We're expecting once we get those second quarter numbers in, summer, in the summer of 2020 coming up here uh, is when we'll start to see those steep declines. Uh, we are expecting about a 13% decline in sales tax revenue for the remainder of the fiscal year. <clears throat> this is what it looks like when it's annualized uh, in terms of what the city received uh, last year. Actual receipts for sales tax, $77.4 million. Uh, we're again showing about uh, a decrease there of down to $72.7 million. And again, that's annualized. Public safety vital services measure, again, I mentioned earlier, we saw significantly higher than anticipated revenue for the first two quarters of the fiscal year. Uh, again, we're projecting some significant declines in this revenue source for the remainder of the fiscal year. What the net result of all that is, is we were going to probably show about a $5 million surplus at the end of the year with PSVS. That's now down to $2 million. Uh, as Mr. Clegg mentioned, that'll provide some flexibility, I believe, in going into next year, along with the fact that, again, um, all the PSVS revenue is not allocated to ongoing costs. So again, I'm trying to be optimistic. There's an optimistic uh, point there. So in terms of what we're doing uh, immediately, uh, within the general fund, we're estimating about a $3 million gap between, uh, in the current year between revised revenues and our current appropriations. Uh, because we have ongoing vacant budgeted positions uh, throughout the year, uh, that'll help cover uh, that amount, we believe. Uh, what that does, though, is it'll reduce the year-end ba fund balance that would normally be rolled into next year's budget. Uh, we've also taken the measure of, of putting in place a general fund hiring freeze. It's not something we, we uh, like to do because we know that there are all critical positions throughout the organization. Uh, but what it allows us to do is begin to accrue savings, and that will likely continue into next fiscal year. I want to be clear, that doesn't include freezes on uh, PSVS positions, there are public safety exemptions where we're trying to meet uh, the needs of the community in terms of police officers and firefighters. A little bit different of a chart here, but this is moving into next fiscal year. And what I wanted to show here was where we started our budget process back in February, late January, early, early February, and what has transpired to today to give you some magnitude of how we're having to retool our budget. So again, hotel tax, we estimated a pretty flat year, 9.9 .9 million in the current year, which is now not 9.9 .9 million, uh, but we projected 9.9 .9 million next year. Uh, we're now projecting about a 21% decrease compared to what we originally thought, so we're down to about $7.8 million. 
Again, Bradley Burns sales tax, also close to a 13% decrease. PSVS, about a 10% decrease. And again, property tax, we're, we're not estimating, we're, we're just seeing a slight decrease. Uh, but again, that's, that's really not uh, indicative of some potentially longer term declines in property tax if this lasts. So again, I'll just walk through each source real quick. Uh, transient occupancy tax, uh, we're, we're in the first half of next fiscal year, we're likely not to see very much recovery. Uh, we do believe based upon information that we're getting that there will be a slight uptick in hotel occupancy starting in first quarter of 2021. I don't believe we're obviously going to be back uh, to what normal is, but we do believe based upon some information that there is uh, reason to believe that, that that will show some growth. What does this all mean in terms of our TOT budget for next year? It means we're going to bring to you a much smaller capital projects list. That's where this funding is utilized. Uh, it'll mainly be focused on critically deferred types of projects and local matches where we've received state and federal grants that require a local match. We like to leverage those funds and if there's not another appropriate local match funding source that we have, uh, this is where we prioritize those monies. Bradley Burns, again, same story, uh, revised downwards. You may have noticed or, or heard that the governor's office uh, has put into place a small business sales tax deferment program. Uh, so we have run the numbers through our sales tax consultant that has the potential uh, to defer about $1.4 million in sales tax payments to the city. Uh, the intent is to th receive that revenue at some point in time, but it's, it's a cash flow issue. Uh, not necessarily a uh, revenue loss issue. If you recall last year, we talked about the Wayfair decision, and this was a federal Supreme Court decision that requires out-of-state businesses and online businesses to remit sales tax uh, when they're making transactions in, or selling product or goods in the state of California. Uh, that has shown to be a positive. So while we're showing decreases in our sales tax for next year, the Wayfair decision uh, is, is still being ramped up and still being implemented uh, through the state, and we believe that there will be a slight offset. Uh, we're doing some further analysis with our sales tax consultant uh, on that issue, but again, another positive in my mind. So briefly, I'll just show you again, this is our uh, year-to-date, or these are actuals for the prior year. I just showed you the projection for next year going or for the current year 1920 and this is the projection for the following year so you kind of get an idea of how we're stair stepping down psvs again pretty much the same impacts i talked to you just a moment ago uh, in terms of, of reduced retail sales the wayfair decision again that one significant difference that psvs is not committed to ongoing cost in its entirety we are, as Mr. Clegg mentioned, going to be balancing the need for additional services and those priorities through the measure uh, with the need to look at reserves, contingencies, and economic recovery planning. Quickly, just some other items that are going to be revenue sources that will be impacted next year. Gas tax, uh, based upon the reduction in gas prices and the reduced consumption, there are complex formulas that determine how much the city receives in gas tax. Uh, and we know that the amount will be reduced. We do not have those updated numbers just yet uh, from the state or from the League of California Cities. We're expecting those within the next couple of weeks once the Governor's May revised budget is released. We know that the longer we keep uh, certain um, facilities closed, any sort of fee-based programs, uh, park reservations, et cetera, will be impacted. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as we fully kind of get into the, the impacts of this, we will start to see those housing starts go down. Again, that remodel work that we're seeing right now, we are not sure if that's uh, a kind of an interim blip or, or a longer term uh, pattern, but we know that that's not going to offset uh, what would normally be a normal year of, of housing growth. Our budget process, as I talked about, is evolving. Uh, we kicked off the, project, the, the process in January. Uh, most recently, based upon some new information that I just shared with you, we directed our departments uh, to revise the general fund operating budgets, excluding PSVS, to show 0% growth over next year or over last year's adopted budgets. Even with that, 
uh, we are projecting uh, right now, and we're working towards closing a pretty sizable uh, gap uh, between the two uh, with our revised revenues versus our, our uh, expenditures that are in the, in the system right now as proposed. Uh, and we will be working diligently over the next couple weeks in bringing to you options to close that gap. Uh, we don't probably likely have any ability to address staffing within the general fund for next year outside of, again, this is excluding PSVS. But in regards to PSVS, we are reviewing uh, phase two proposals and to make sure that we're, we're trying to continue that momentum of meeting those priorities, but again, recognizing the challenges. Just a couple more slides and I will wrap up and be able to answer any questions. Uh, we are again likely going to continue that hiring freeze with those exemptions that I talked about. I know that there has been uh, quite a bit of interest in looking at ways we can accelerate and prioritize reserves. Uh, and so that'll be something you'll see come forward. And I will just say this now, um, and I, I, I will come at no surprise, that what we talk about today, what we talk about in a couple weeks and as we move uh, through the ne next uh, six to 12 months. It'll be an evolving process. There will be an adopted budget at some point by this council, but I can um, tell you that we're likely going to be coming back obviously and giving you updates and things will change. So uh, we should be prepared for that. Longer term outlook. Uh, again, I mentioned that starting a couple fiscal years from now, property tax revenues will begin to decline if uh, some sort of meaningful recovery is not underway. We still have minimum wage and other mandated cost increases uh, that are, are requirements that will have to be built into the budget. Uh, many of us have sat on a couple different webinars uh, with CalPERS. They project or they, their target investment returns on an annual basis are 7%. Uh, a couple weeks ago, they were looking at a negative 4%. Uh, as of this week, it's tracked back up to about 1%. Final numbers coming uh, in July, and we'll know uh, what the ultimate impacts to the city's rates are, but CalPERS has said um, pretty much directly, cities should be expecting uh, cost increases ramping up starting in fiscal year 23. Notwithstanding, we have some significant projects on the horizon. Just two that I wanna mention are our enterprise resource planning system, which is our main accounting and HR system, or we're using uh, a 25-year-old system that has uh, you know, significant hurdles for efficiencies, and we are in the process of starting to look at uh, products that would ultimately replace that. And then again, just the, one that, the other one that you're aware of is our regional public safety radio system. Again, uh, we're essentially on borrowed time with antiquated technology. Well, the slide cut off. I think that's a sign for me to wrap it up. Uh, but I, I wanted to just briefly mention that we are tracking several fiscal stimulus and cost recovery uh, items as it relates to COVID. There's been a lot of movement. This is almost a daily update. This week, the county allocated $20 million to cities out of their CARES Act funding based upon an initial per capita approach that they are looking to use. The city of Bakersfield would receive $13 million for eligible costs. We're meeting with, all the cities will be meeting with the county in the next week or two uh, to talk about those eligible costs and what would be reimbursable. The federal government is uh, allocating additional HUD funding, about $3.4 million from its various programs to the city of Bakersfield uh, for small business assistance, homelessness, and I believe there will be an, uh, an item on your next agenda to, to discuss that. Uh, there is the ability to recover uh, some costs through FEMA uh, in terms of a disaster recovery. Uh, that's to be determined. There's a lot of moving parts here and what pot some of these costs will be allocated to, uh, but that is there and available to us. And then finally, the one that cut off was the Federal Reserve's Municipal Liquidity um, Program. Every city, 250,000 people or more was identified to have an amount potentially available for short-term borrowing. Uh, and, and the city of Bakersfield through the formula, through the, the Fed, uh, had the, has the ability to borrow up to $71 million. Uh, I'm not saying this is anything that the city is going to be pursuing, uh, but it's on our radar and I just uh, wanted to make you aware of it, but it is a non-forgivable loan uh, type of, of program. We're revising our budget process. 
May 27th, we'll be back in front of you to kick off the process and have some department presentations. The June 8th and the 24th meetings, we will keep as is on the calendar uh, with our, our workshops and the budget adoption. That is it. I appreciate the time. Uh, thank you for um, listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hewatt. Madam Clerk, did we happen to receive any public speaker cards on this workshop item? We have not. Is there, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to comment on the workshop item? Seeing none. Uh, for those of you who are viewing this online, if you would like to comment, you're welcome to submit an email to the council via the city clerk. So feel free to do that. And now I would like to call on council member and vice mayor Parlier, please. Oh, I am sorry, I was gonna do that first. Yes, uh, colleagues on the phone, anyone like to make a comment first? No comment here. Yes. All right. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Bob Smith. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. I just appreciate the work that staff has done and uh, very difficult circumstances and uh, you know, we're definitely moving in the right direction. We realize where we're at and We'll continue to uh, make things work out for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Nice presentation, Chris. Uh, you know, there's no doubt we're probably going to take a significant haircut, but as you look at the slide that you presented uh, with other municipalities, I mean, really going to be in dire straits with massive layoffs and, and different draconian steps that they're going to have to take just to survive. And uh, the one reason, or there's actually several reasons, uh, that Bakersfield is going to, I believe, make it through this. Uh, one is our staff, which are excellent. Um, two is we've always been a fiscally frugal city. And getting back to what the city manager said, you know, we're, we're light on staff compared to a lot of cities our size, which right now is an advantage. Uh, another thing is measure in. Uh, the council, uh, Alan Tandy, you, several people have been involved with it, but uh, most importantly, uh, the citizens of Bakersfield that recognize that need, because right now that is a safety net, uh, security blanket for, uh, for Bakersfield. Um, so I just want to thank you for that, and uh, good job, Chris. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Freeman. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I wanted to comment that it, your forecast of revenues in 21, because the, I mean the last, we only really got hit by at most one quarter for this year, so we're okay for this year. Um, my impression is that you have kind of a V-shaped recovery, as they're saying all over, and. Uh, I think we need to be very cautious about this V-shaped recovery. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot more severe um, to rebuild the businesses that have been harmed by this, and it's going to be, I think this is more of a three-year deal. So I would caution you as you go through looking at, because you pretty much said, hey, it's not really much of a problem for us. Uh, I don't want you coming in and, you know, after the first quarter of next year saying, well, you know, we were really wrong about that. Uh, I, I just think we need to be cautious about um, the tax revenue. Property tax is pretty steady, you know, and I don't think we really have a lot of oil within the city. The county will probably get hit. So we noticed last time property taxes really didn't get affected. And the sales taxes, I think, will be impacted. And, and maybe if we are getting more from this Internet uh, uh, allocation that we aren't getting and there's more to come, that's great. That'd be a great offset. Uh, uh, I, I, I just caution you to think, I don't think we're, in, I don't think we're gonna see a V-shaped recovery. Uh, another just comment, as you say, we have a hiring freeze. Um, I think there were some critical new positions that we needed, like an economic development department and stuff, so maybe those come out of the uh, measure N funds, but I, critical, positions, I would not want to say, well, no, we can't afford to do that because we're going to need economic development and people targeted working on that. Can, can someone, Chris or 
Yeah, I'd be happy to respond to that. Um, first, the, the hiring freeze is focused on the general fund, and while that might seem disparate um, to allow PSVS positions to move forward, because we can and we don't want to reduce our capacity, we will move forward with targeted PSVS positions. Um, but we'll take a harder look at the general fund, and it will absolutely be around the priorities of the council, so our economic development work is in that bucket, so is public safety, and we'll move forward with those. I would also uh, respond on the concern about, you know, how bad could things be, and, and absolutely looking at this next year's budget from that lens. Again, uh, this is oversimplifying things, and, you know, Chris can't kick me from this distance. Um, I'm getting a little bit ahead of our, our uh, May 27th meeting, but when you look at, you know, the, the 60 plus million dollars in PSVS and really about 25 to 30 million dollars of that is programmed. So that leaves a significant amount of room to do a few targeted things, but then set aside that $9 million in reserves as program for next year, probably an equal amount of what I would call sort of contingency fund mm -hmm. that, that we could say these may be capital projects that if we get through two quarters and we see that sales tax is gonna be about what we thought it would be, we could move on those capital projects. But if it doesn't, that's another 9 million that's available to us as a, an extra backstop. So I'm thinking of double or triple coverage in that zone, meaning we're anticipating those significant reductions. We're going to budget to those. We're going to put away that, that $9 million in reserves and another bucket of a similar size of contingency. So absolutely want to um, move in that direction. We're still refining what those actual numbers will look like. But I'm calling it sort of our extra contingency beyond building up those reserves to hold those funds in abeyance to make sure we're OK after one or two quarters. Okay, okay no, I, I appreciate that. And I think uh, the timeliness of Measure N looking back is even more uh, astounding. Uh, we kind of we kind of lucked out on that one. Um, I will just give you a little bit of my experience having been through four horrendous recessions, because I'm you know, Jackie and I are the senior people down here. Um, it's always worse than you thought it was going to be, or you put into your projections every single time. We didn't project, we did spreadsheets, we did business plans, we did the budgets, big company, it was always worse. And coming, when it was coming, it was always better and we under budgeted how good it was going to be. I think there's something about human nature, we don't want to admit to ourselves that something it could be, we can't believe it could be so good when it goes, but so we're always off in our projections. And I said, I was always off for, for recession, so I just think we probably will be too. Thank you, Councilmember Freeman. I don't see any other requests to speak. Uh, Vice Mayor, receive and file. Motion to receive and file. We have a motion to receive and file. We'll do this by roll call. Mayor, I apologize. Councilmember Parlier. <laughs> Aye. Uh, Councilmember Rivera. Aye. Councilmember Gonzalez. Aye. Councilmember Weir. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Freeman. Yes. And Councilmember Sullivan. Yes. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you very much. And Mr. Hewat, thank you for your presentation. Mr. Clegg, thank you also. So it is now 5.18 and we stand adjourned. Uh, we will be starting another meeting in uh, very, very shortly. So j if anybody needs a little break, let's just take five minutes uh, in case anybody needs to. So uh, for those of you who are listening, we are going to start the meeting a little later and we'll be back uh, in about five minutes. Thank you. <laughs>